receive our morning offering, would you multitask with me and meet me in the book of Ephesians, um, Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to pick right back up where Michael left off. How many of you enjoyed Michael Field last week, enjoyed the message? What an amazing word from God. Now, I know half of y'all weren't here last week uh, because statistically, you only come twice a month. Uh, so I know that. But if you missed last week, go online and listen to that message. I am literally going to pick up right where Michael left off. I'm literally going to pick up right where Michael left off. So if you, if you watch that message online, um, and you'll be able to get up to date and hear the fullness of this thing called gathering in a life of worship that we're talking about. So let's go back to Ephesians chapter 2 where Michael was last week. Uh, Let's begin reading at verse 11. Hear these words of our Father. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Here we go. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now, oh, you got to love a but now like that. You got to love that. But now, everybody shout, but now. In Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose uh, was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord and in him you too. Somebody shout you too. You too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. You too are being built together so that you might become a dwelling of God's spirit. God's spirit wants to dwell in you. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much for the privilege of your word. Father, I thank you for the power of your word. Father, I pray that in these next few moments you would speak to us like only you can. Father, would you tune our ear to your voice so that we might hear you ever so clearly. Father, would you turn our hearts toward you so that we might experience the fullness of all that you have for us. God, it's to that end that I ask that you stand in my body, think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you would have us say, know, and do. May the words of my mouth, meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, you are my strength. You are my redeemer. Get glory in this place. In Jesus' name. Every heart said amen. Amen. There is, there is a, a terminology that I want to continue to build upon. Uh, Michael laid a, a, a theological foundation of what's happening in the church uh, and what happened when the cross uh, was found empty uh, from Jesus' body to the tomb and the tomb then found empty. The implications was that the veil was rent the, uh, the, the separation between God and man, humanity, woman and man, the separation was split. And now there was no longer this vertical 
uh, separation. Um, man and woman were reconciled to God through the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Right? We get that? Not only does the cross go vertical, though, but it's horizontal. Uh, and there are horizontal implications as well as vertical implications in response to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, my friend wrote a book. He called it the cross-shaped gospel. Uh, cross-shaped gospel. Brian Loritz, he wrote the cross-shaped gospel. Implication is the gospel, as you think about its fullness, is in the shape of a cross. The gospel brings good news both vertically and horizontally. Uh, the gospel brings change in our heart and our life both vertically and horizontally. Vertically, we are restored and reconciled to God. Horizontally, we'll reconcile to one another. We'll reconcile to one another. If you move either one of them, you lose the cross. You, you lose either one of them, you lose the cross. Here's the problem. Most times in culture, we celebrate the vertical reconciliation. We celebrate. We talk about it all the time. These are churches, and you go to places, and they talk about my personal relationship with Jesus. My personal Jesus and me. Me and Jesus. If I got me and Jesus, that's all I need. That sounds great. It's just not biblical. It's not biblical. It's not just about you. We even say, if, if I was the only one, Jesus Christ would have died for me. And, it's, and I get what you're trying to say, but the implications of that, you're, you're totally betraying the heart of God. It wasn't just about you. When he died on the cross, he did not have you on his mind. He had us on his mind. Do you understand the difference? See, one allows you to make you think that all heaven runs for your house. All heaven is orchestrated for the success and the winning of your house. And the other houses on your block, hey, I hope they're as lucky with Jesus as I am. I hope they have the favor. I got the favor. I don't know about them. Hey, I got to get mine. You got to get yours. You work out how you get more yours. I got mine. Why? Because I got my personal Jesus. Just not biblical. That's not what he, he did not die and come on the cross, die on the cross for the Jenkins family. He didn't die on the cross for the Johnson family. He didn't die on the cross for the, I'm trying to find a, 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 a white people's name. Uh, <laughs> Jenkins, Johnson, who? Smith. He didn't die for the Smith family. Good old white Smith people. He did not die for you. You know what I'm saying? He didn't just die for the Lopez family. You know what I'm saying? Jennifer's nice, but it was more than he had more than Jennifer on his mind. More than the Lopez's, more than the, than the Lee's family. Do you understand what I'm saying? He died for us. Here's the problem. We have a tendency to grab one side of the cross. And we disregard the horizontal implications. Jesus cares very much about how we see one another. As a matter of fact, there are passages of Scripture. If you want to sum up the gospel in two verses, here it is. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. You see the cross? You see that? You take away one. If you just take the horizontal, then you got social justice. Social justice without the truth of the gospel is just good ethics. And good ethics ain't saving nobody's soul. Do, do you see what I'm saying? It'll teach you how to behave, but it won't teach you who to be. You, you see what I'm saying? So social justice alone is not enough. And the gospel vertical, this vertical relationship, me and Jesus just having a love affair, that's great, but you can have a love affair with Jesus and be a jerk to your neighbor. You know, and most people that use that language usually are jerks to their neighbor. Do you know what I'm saying? They're, they're so in love with Jesus. They're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. Y'all heard that before? So the, and y'all know these people. These are people that are deeply religious, deeply loving of God, and deeply mean, rude, and deeply irritating. You know what I'm saying? These are these same people because they could care less about their neighbor. They just want to make sure Jesus is at their house. And as long as Jesus is at their house, the neighborhood got to figure it out. We don't get to do that. So I want to talk about, as we talk about this idea of gathering in community, as we talk about this vision that we want to implement here at Fellowship, there are three things that you need to know 
that reveal God's heart about community, about what does it mean for us to do life with one another. The first thing that I need you to capture and that I need you to understand is that relationships matter. If you write notes, and everybody should be, I've been working all week, you'll write something down. <laughs> relationships matter. How you see one another matters. You don't get to just have a loving relationship with Jesus Christ and treat your neighbor however you want. You just don't get to do that. Relationships matter. You know why it matters? Can I just give you the why? My kids, I got three kids, 11, nine, and six years old. Sometimes they're good. Sometimes they ain't. Sometimes they're well-behaved little angels, and then they wake up. <laughs> and it goes downhill from there. You know what I mean? Like, it, it is different. I don't care how they behave. I don't care what they do or what they say. You mistreat my child. Oh, I'll take this robe off real quick. <laughs> you, you, you know what I'm saying? Don't let this robe fool you. You know what I mean? There's a whole lot of flesh up under here. And that flesh will become unleashed on you. You mess with my child. I don't care if my child did do something wrong. If you chastise them in a way that robs them of life, that's abusive, that, that says to them you don't matter, that denies them their worth, you say anything. Oh, y'all talk about a mama bear? Oh, I'm a papa bear. You know what I mean? And I'm a bear that's, 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 you know, that's, I don't know, that takes steroids or something. I don't know. I'm, I will go off. You know what I'm saying? Because you don't, you, don't take from my, you don't take worth and dignity from my child. Here's the thing. If I'm an earthly father and I'm that possessive on my children, how do you think God feels about his children? That's why you can't talk to your neighbor any kind of way. Why? That's God's child. Do you think God is just going to sit in heaven and allow you to steal and take worth and dignity and significance from his child? I don't care if they did misbehave. I don't care what they did. You don't get to take life from them because you didn't give them life. So if you didn't give them life, you don't get to take life from them. So he says, relationships matter. I am your father, your heavenly father. You are my children. I care how you treat your sisters and your brothers. It matters. So you just can't treat people any kind of way. As a matter of fact, Jesus equates, equates treating and disregarding your sister and brother as murder. Because what is murder? Murder is literally taking life. And you can take life more than just one way. You can take emotional life, you can take social life, you can take spiritual life, you can take away life. He says, you don't get to do that to my children. As a matter of fact, he says to them, Matthew, these are Jesus' words, Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. Y'all know what that means, but here's the thing. Anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Y'all get that, right? Let me, let me take you a little deeper. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, listen to this, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar first. Go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. What he's saying is the word Raka, it's the word that literally means, y'all know what that means, like whatever. <laughs> Talk to them. You don't exist. Talk, you, I could care less about you and your existence. It, it's literally, here, here's how we sum it up. You're dead to me. You're dead to me. If you do that, you've murdered them. You've said to them, you don't exist. You've taken life from them. You've said, in my mind, you don't exist. I could care less. Child, she, don't, she is nothing to me. He is nothing to me. I don't care. Have, have, you see how that language just oozes out of us? It's kind of common. You let somebody get on your nerves, oh, child, she ain't nothing to me. He ain't nothing to me. He don't even matter. Why do you even care? He don't even exist in my mind. I unblocked him on Instagram, and if he ain't, I blocked him on Instagram. So if he blocked on Instagram, he does not exist. He's dead to me. Do, do you see what I'm saying? God says, yeah, that's great for the world. Those of you that name the name of Jesus Christ, you don't get to live that way. 
You don't get to rock up my children. That's my daughter. You don't get to rock up my daughter. Yeah, I know she had a bad attitude. I know she was, she was wrong for what she did. Still, you don't get to rock her. You don't get to say you're dead to me. You don't get to dismiss people. Relationships matter. It matters so much, he says, he speaks to their church structure, to that worship structure. They, back then, they would have to come and they would come to the temple and they would offer a sacrifice to be, to be offered to, be, to redeem and restore their vertical connection. He says, yeah, 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 you can keep your sacrifice because there is no b- vertical reconciliation without horizontal reconciliation. He says, yeah, 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 yeah. In, in other words, translation, you go to church singing your song, you can stop singing. Cut, cut, you know, don't even go to the second verse. Get your behind up, get your purse, go outside, call her, apologize, ask for forgiveness, then come back, sing the chorus in the verse. You know what he's saying? It doesn't matter if you have a great vertical heart and you're worshiping me vertically. If you're broken with your sister or your brother, we are broken. And it has to be restored. I'm not impressed by your songs. I'm not impressed by your sermon attendance. I'm not impressed by your Bible study because what good is the sermon, the song, or the Bible study if you are still broken and rockaing your sister or your brother? No rocka. Ought to be a song. No rocka, no rocka, no rocka. No rocka, no rocka, no rocka. You don't get to rock up my children. You don't get to rock up your sister or brother. So if you're sitting here and you know that your brother has an alt with you, you know that your sister has an alt with you, stop singing and go fix it. Because relationships matter to God. It matters your relationship. And I get it. There's some relationships that are out of your capacity to fix. But you better have done all you could. Have you set the table? Whether they come to the table and sit down is up to them. We can't force anybody. You can't call and be like, come on, we got to make up. Jesus, my pastor said, I can't even sing good worship unless we do that. So come on, just no rocker, no rocker, no rocker, no rocker. Come on, like, come on, help me out. I want to go back to church again. Well, that's not what I'm saying. There's some people that have rocked you and they're done, they're done with you. The thing is, they got to stand before God for that. You got to stand before God with your relationships. He's going to say, what did you do? They didn't want to talk to me. Send them a card, just thinking of you, praying for you. They can't cuss you out with a card. (laughs) If they do, you can't hear them, it's a card. (laughs) You you know what I'm saying? Say, hey, I know it was hard. I'm open to talking whenever you are. Love you, and I'm sorry. You send that card. If they don't respond, it's up to them, but you've done faithfulness and said, Lord, I've done all that I could do because I got to stand right before you. Do do y'all understand what I'm saying? So here's the thing. Everything Michael talked about last week, everything I'm talking about this week, all this gathering in the community and all of that, I'm saying you can make the mistake of saying, I don't want that part. I don't want the horizontal part. When you desire, when when you deny the horizontal reconciliation of the cross, you deny the cross itself. Did y'all get that? I'm just going to sit right there on that one. I'm just going to stay right. And this ain't even a comfortable position. I don't know why I even ended up in this position. This is like a broke hip position. I, I've never stood like this before in my life, but I'm just going to stay right here because I started it. Listen, you deny the cross itself. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, no rocker, no rocker, no rocker. Turn to your neighbor and say, what are you doing? You sitting there looking at me. Turn to your <laughs> That was terrible. It'll never become a song like that. That was terrible. <laughs> number two, number one, relationships matter. Number two, he's calling us to deep reconciliation, not cheap reconciliation. All right? He's calling us to deep reconciliation, not cheap reconciliation. See, this wall in the temple which represents the horizontal divide that happens in our life. Thing is, if we choose to live on the other side of this wall, we tend choose to live segregated from one another. We choose to live in our own communities, with our own people, in our own way, in our own understanding. We create walls culturally in our society. I grew up all black church, all black community, uh, shoot. I ain't never saw a white person in our church unless they was coming to fix something or sell something. Um, 
all black church, and I loved it. Shaped me, gave me a theological foundation that I still stand on today. My whole neighborhood, my community was all of that, but I had one understanding, I had one perspective, and as I had to grow to school and everything, obviously, as a minority, we have to learn and navigate the majority culture's world. So we, we learn and navigate that, but for the most part, there was a season in my life where all I knew was my side of the wall. Here's the problem when you live your whole life on your side of the wall. Y'all can't see me, can you? I can't see you either. That's part of the problem. If I can't see you, I can't even begin to understand you or empathize with you. We've lost empathy. Listen to the news, listen to the public discourse. We don't have empathy for one another. We can't hear one another, why? Because we live in our own little worlds and we can't see one another. We even have algorithm, algorithms now on Facebook to where only things that, that come up on your feed are things that show up on your side of the wall. We watch news channels that perpetuate news titles, subjects, and themes that illuminate our side of the wall, our perspective. So my whole life is about being reinfor reinforcing my perspective from my side of the wall and I can't see you, and you can't see me. And at best, what we do is in moments throughout life, we peek over. <laughs> and when I see you, I see you as other. Because what, what my perspective is, is what's normal to me. And what's normal to me is what's right to me. So my right normal perspective sees your perspective and I see it as other, I see it as different, and ultimately I see it as kind of wrong. Do y'all see where I'm going with this? So we look at our biggest, our big, the biggest systems and structures that separate us. Politics, race, religion, money, these are all systems and structures sent from the pit of hell to segregate God's people. And when we live our faith according to these segregated systems, it makes it absolutely impossible for us to affectionately see one another, understand one another, and we can't even begin to empathize with one another. Because what you're talking about ain't even normal. That ain't even, that we normalize it. And if it's normal, then it's right. Y'all don't believe me? Y'all don't see that? What color are Band-Aids? They're flesh, they're skin, they're skin color, right? They're flesh tones, right? Who's flesh? You ever thought about that? And I, and I, ain't, trying to make, I ain't trying to make you feel bad because the, the, the Band-Aids was white. Y'all didn't help that. Ain't nobody, did anybody in here make Band-Aids? Anybody in here create it? Well, I'm not talking to you. But we've got to be able to talk about the system, though. There's a system that says white is normal. These Band-Aids are normal. Emojis, originally, what color are they? Why? Kind of like yellowish white, you know what I mean? <laughs> but now they got them in all colors, why? Because they was like, yo, if I'm gonna be sending somebody a happy face, I need to, I wanna, can I get a black happy face, please? <laughs> Do I have to become white to text message emotions on, on the line? And I'm picking small light things for you to see a bigger system that's at play. We've got a system that normalizes one and pronounces the other as other. And with normalization, there becomes a prioritization. That means that's prioritized and the other is less prioritized. And I'm talking about we live this every day in our life because we live on our side of the wall and all I do is peek over. What's going on over there in them communities? Okay, that's nice. Let me get back to my stuff. You know what I mean? And I see it all as other. And then what we do is we experience uh, uh, reconciliation, uh, and, and we, you know, we do stuff like, you know, I got a black pastor. I'm tearing down this wall. <laughs> I got, shoot, I got, I got, I got white friends, child. My, white, my, my baby godmama white. Look at the pictures. Check that out. Just, you know what I mean? So, you know, you got, you got white people saying, yeah, not only I'm white, but shoot, I, I went to see Black Panther, Wakanda forever for me too. You know what I mean? Shoot. Y'all, 
Y'all act like it wasn't a white guy in the movie. It was a white guy. I was in there. You know what I mean? And you start looking and see our church is woke. We, shoot, we got a, a black pastor. We got a white pastor. Shoot, we even got an Asian pastor. We got an Asian pastor. His whole family's Asian. They all came to our church. They in there. We, we in there, Jack. We got everything, you know? And what you begin to do is you begin to cross over and experience the other side. I begin to experience other perspectives and other people's way of life and other, other, other ways of experiencing life and understanding. And we begin to do this reconciliation. But this is the problem because in this reconciliation where it's, you know, I got some white friends, I got a little ass shoe. It's the UN over here. We got United Nations. We just all, and we all sit together in the same room on Sundays. It's beautiful. And we all experience this reconciliation. And then Trump get elected. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what just happened, but it is. See, because those systems carry a culture to it. And when you experience that kind of systemic, systemic disruption, you want to go back to your side where it's safe, where people think like you. So let me go back over here where all my Republicans at. Let me go back over here where all my Democrats are. Why? Because the system is designed to segregate and destroy the family and the body of Christ. So what we do is we, we then settle for cheap reconciliation. Cheap reconciliation says, I come over there for worship and for worship service on Sunday and a little bit of life group. But when it comes to politics, money, issues, uh, immigration, all that, I go back over to my side of the wall where people understand me, where I understand them. Do y'all see the problem? See, that's cheap reconciliation. It's not deep reconciliation. God says we got to go deeper. We've got to engage in these conversations and experience the fullness of the other and in that use empathy so that we might hear and see one another, so that we might be stretched, so that we might stretch our perspective. Y'all know what we do, though. We experience this kind of reconciliation in this street. We got different folks in our family. We got folks coming over for dinner. We just mixing it up. This way different than what I am. And when, when, when crisis comes up, cultural crisis, whether it's an election, whether it's an issue about guns, whether it's an issue about poverty in our country, whether it's an issue about immigration, all the stuff that the world says the church should never talk about. Although I find it interesting because Jesus talked about all of these all the time. They want us to shut up. Why? Because they want us to perpetuate the segregation. Because the devil knows if we ever learn how to bring the gospel to bear on these systems, we'll destroy the systems. And he doesn't want us to destroy the systems. He doesn't want us to destroy one another. Do you understand what I'm saying? But if we can ever have a conversation about the systems of privilege, the systems of access, the systems of racism, the systems of, 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 if we can ever talk about the systems, then we, we, we can destroy the systems. Satan just wants us to keep talking to each other and destroying one another and fighting one another. So what we do oftentimes in this multi-ethnic community, once we got this diversity, what we do, instead of engaging in the conversation in a way, when that stuff, when that crisis happens, oh man, we go to our side and we just start, we just start shooting, we just bring out our gun and we like, what, you voted for who? What just happened, what, what's going on? And we just start, we just start shooting people. We just like, boom, it's just, and we be on Facebook just shooting people and just doing that and just, we just firing shots. And now here we are, our brothers and sisters in Christ, we just shooting one another, we just hitting one another. Y'all, you nervous, ain't you? That's how I feel when I'm looking at Facebook at folks from my church doing these racial issues. I'm nervous. I don't know what y'all gonna say. Because we're shooting one another. We don't have a greater vision. Now all of a sudden we're shooting our brother and sister and we bring a fight to the conversation. Here we are called by God building something beautiful and the enemy wants us to shoot one another. And what we need to bring, instead of bringing, instead of, <laughs> instead of, because instead of bringing a fight to the conversation, he says, I want you to bring fruit to the conversation. I want you to bring fruit to the conversation. Because aren't we the same people that were just in the vine and the vine was in us? And out of that vine, what came out of us? The fruit of the Spirit. So how you go from, I'm not going to throw it, I'm not going to hit you. 
I don't throw it. I'm just playing. No, 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 no. no. He, says, he, says, he says, we need to bring, don't bring a fight, bring fruit. So when you have the conversation, can I just remind y'all, Galatians chapter 5, go back there. Let me, can I just remind you, the fruit, what the fruit of the Spirit is, but the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy. This is what you bring to the conversation with people that don't look like you, don't live like you, don't vote like you. And when crisis and culture happens, this is what you bring to the conversation. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The world is longing for the church to take its rightful place to lead the conversation on our differences in this country, not to be falling victim to the system of this conversation. They're longing for us. And when we show up, we need to bring, what if you brought gentleness to your enemy? What if you brought kindness to your brother, your sister that disagreed? I mean, they believe something that you would spend the rest of your life fighting against. What would it mean for you to bring a banana to that, not a bazooka? You, do you understand what I'm saying? But man, I, what I've seen us do in Christian faith, not only have we run the risk of stuff like that, we was like, all right, let me put this back. <laughs> I thought I was going to do reconciliation. But not, not only that, but we come back to our side and we amp up. We get bigger ammo and we like, oh, I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to, ah! What you say you believe? That's crazy. You can't believe that. Ah! just hitting people with our opinions, hitting people with our perspective and how it was like growing up on my side of the wall and what I perspective. And you're missing the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The enemy wants the segregation to continue to divide us. How in the world can a segregated church get you ready for a segregated heaven? H hello in here, somebody. Because we know with a segregation comes a segregation mentality. I know there are places for eth eth ethnic-centric churches, and I get that, and I'm, I'm not trying to wage war against every church that's homogeneous. All I'm saying is if we're going to prepare for heaven, we should at least start practicing now on Sunday morning. We should start practicing now. Because let me tell you something. If you think the gospel fits on one or the other side of this wall, you're crazy. You're crazy. I, the gospel does not fit on the left or the right. So you got to ask yourself the question, if the gospel doesn't fit comfortably in the left or the right, how are you fitting so comfortably in the left or the right? Do, do you understand what I'm saying? How can you so arrogantly choose one side of the wall and perpetuate it and hold it up on the other side of the other when the gospel of Jesus Christ literally comes, it literally comes not to stand on one side of the wall, but to literally destroy and break down the walls. That's why the gospel comes. So if you find yourself safely tucked under the Republican side of the wall, in some shape or fashion, you've denied some of the gospel. You find yourself nicely nestled on the left democratic side of the wall. At some point, you've denied a significant portion of the gospel. All of their platforms, look at both their platforms, look at them, study them. You will not see the sum total of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You will not see it. You will not see it. So take the shirt off. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Why are we so quick to wear a banner of something that doesn't encompass this? All you need is one. Put this on your shirt. Put this on your tag. Oh, y'all ain't clapping on that. You like, I like my shirt. <laughs> you know why this is, you know why this, these are the roots of evil. Because if we ever start naming and tearing down the system, instead of calling names and tearing down people, then the church will take its rightful place in culture and society and we'll gain our voice and culture. There's a, there's a final thing. I, I've got to wrap it up here. He's saying, don't bring a fight, bring fruit. Um, because this is how we get deep reconciliation. I know we got Republicans in here. I know we got Democrats in here. 
I know we've got people that are engaged and passionately broken over immigration, and we got people that have completely mentally opted out and can care less what happens to those dreamers. I'm saying the gospel calls us all together with fruit at the centerpiece of the conversation, drenched in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have to have hard conversations on how we love all God's people and how we display that love through the context of laws and rules and society and recognizing sometimes those laws have got to be bent to fit the gospel, but the gospel can never be bent to fit those laws. Are are y'all in here with me? Are y'all in here with me? Do you understand what I'm saying? I'll, cl- I'll close with this. Um, relationships matter. He's calling us to deep reconciliation and not cheap reconciliation. And deep reconciliation is messy. Look at the stage. Some of you type A personalities, you are undone right now. <laughs> you are undone. Like that box leaning over like that, you're like, that is so, I could, if he would just lift it up, then I can finish engaging in the word of Jesus Christ. (laughs) What about the box that's on the floor? And what about all of those Nerf bullets that he sent out to the audience? Are they going to recollect those? Is he going to have enough for the 1145 service? What are we going to do? Are people going to take those home? Should we sweep them up? Did anyone get hit in the eye? Oh my goodness. That's how the enemy gets us. Sorry, no offense to the type A personality, but... The enemy uses us all. This is just how he uses you. (laughs) You know why? Because in comparison to the truth that's being spoken, none of these things matter. And he gets us focused on all of the things that don't matter in the world. So we'll miss the one thing that does. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. Last thing. Relationships matter. Deep reconciliation, not cheap reconciliation. Caveat parenthesis, deep reconciliation is messy. It's messy, it's messy, it's messy. Third, he's giving you a renewed perspective. A renewed perspective. Every creature, every woman, every man, whether left, right, whether Asian, Latino, white, black, Indian, regardless of ethnicity, God loved them so much that he took time to make them in his image. And he imprinted them with his imago day. This is my prayer for our church. We heard the verse that says over and over in scripture, those that have ears, let them hear. My prayer is that those of us who have eyes, may we see. God, give me a renewed perspective. There are people that I disagree with. There are people that, just the arrogance that they have with their perspective, their unwillingness to listen, just makes me angry. It drives me away from the table and not want to sit at the table. God, for those people in those scenarios, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. I know we used to sing in this song vertically saying, Lord, open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. But I think Lord is saying, no, I want you to look at your brother and sister, and I want you to be able to see me in them. Even if you disagree, you need to be able to speak to the Imago day in their life and say, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. In this disagreement, in our different perspective, I want to see I want to see you. Because could it be that God wants to use our spiritual fruit to be spiritual food to our neighbor? Did you get that? Spiritual fruit, the banana was designed to be eaten. Could it be that that person that we disagree with, that person that we see it so differently, as we say, God, may I bring spiritual food to the conversation that might feed and awaken the Imago Dei in them so that we together might see you in a greater way and experience a greater glory. Not denying who they are, not me denying who I am, but if we bring spiritual fruit to the conversation, we might leave full by his spirit. 
Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. May he give us eyes to see one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. May he awaken through the spiritual fruit and the food that we bring, the Imago Dei in one another, so that we might be a people experiencing deep reconciliation with people that don't look like us, don't live like us, and don't vote like us, but are committed to the continued destruction of the walls of the systems that the enemy has created to perpetuate this idea that people don't matter. People matter. Your story matters. Your experience matters. And I bring fruit to the table and not a fight to the table. I bring empathy so I might know what it is to see you, to hear you, for God's glory to be alive in you. Amen. Amen.